The circle of flow diagram we've built so far represents what we call a closed economy, an economy that's closed off from the rest of the world, that functions entirely independent of the rest of the world. But of course in the real world economies are connected to economies in other parts of the world. And so to complete this circular flow diagram, we're going to have to add one more component. We're going to have to add the rest of the world. So how does the rest of the world connect to the circular flow diagram? Well, one way in which it connects is through the international trade of goods and services. We buy goods from the rest of the world in which case goods flow from the rest of the world into our output markets in exchange for dollars that flow to the rest of the world. When we buy goods from the rest of the world, we call those imports. But we also sell goods to the rest of the world, in which case goods flow from our output markets to the rest of the world in exchange for dollars that flow into our output markets. When we sell goods to the rest of the world, we call those exports. Now, if you think about it, international trade is really just trade across geographic regions that are defined as countries. And we've talked about trade across geographic regions before. We talked about trade in corn between Iowa and North Carolina, where the price of corn was originally low in Iowa and high in North Carolina but that represented an opportunity for arbitrage, to buy low and sell high. So people would go and buy corn in Iowa and ship it to North Carolina. And as long as transportation costs were sufficiently low, that would lead to an equalization of the price of corn across the two markets. That was our very first example of what we called the law of one price. And that same law of one price should apply in international trade. And when it does, we call it purchasing power parity. Now, what's different between international trade and trade between regions within a country? Well, one thing you might think is different is the transportation cost. It might be higher. But let's suppose that it isn't, and we don't have to worry about that. Or you might think that some countries might impose a tariff or a tax on imports, and that would create a compensating price differential that would explain difference in prices across the two countries. But again, let's suppose that tariffs are sufficiently low, we don't have to worry about those. One thing we still have to worry about, though, is that when countries trade with each other, they tend to use different currencies within their countries. That's not something we had to worry about when it came to North Carolina and Iowa where dollars are used in both regions. But when we trade with Japan, or with China, or India, or Europe, or South Africa, we're trading with countries that use different currencies. And that gets us to think about exchange rates. So think about the exchange rate between the dollar and the euro. There are two ways we could express that exchange rate we could express it as how many euros, which we'll denote with this E, does it take to buy one dollar? Or we could express it as how many dollars does it take to buy a euro? Now suppose that it takes 0 0.8 euros to buy a dollar. As soon as we know that number, we know the second number, because the second number is just the inverse of the first. We have to divide 1 by 0 0.8, and we get 1.25. So if it costs 0 0.8 euros to buy a dollar, it'll cost a dollar 25 to buy one euro. These are two equivalent ways of expressing the exchange rate between dollars and euros. They're just framed differently. And we're going to adopt the convention that we're going to call the first of these the exchange rate of the dollar. And we're going to call the second of these the exchange rate of the euro. And we do that because it naturally flows into the way that we talk about 
appreciation and depreciation of a currency. Suppose the dollar appreciates in value. It becomes stronger. It becomes more valuable. Well, in that case, it will take more euros to buy a dollar. So this number would go up, meaning the exchange rate for the dollar would go up. Of course, the other number would go down because it's the inverse, and the exchange rate for the euro would fall. Well, suppose that the euro appreciates in value. It becomes stronger then it'll take more dollars to buy a euro. This number would go up, which means the exchange rate for the euro would go up as the euro appreciates. So suppose that this is the exchange rate between dollars and euros. Now let's think about an example involving trade. Suppose that in Europe, it takes um, 10 euros to buy one bushel of corn. And suppose that in the US it takes ten dollars to buy one bushel of corn. Now at first you might look at that and say, well, the law of one price seems to hold. We have the same price, one in terms of euros and one in terms of dollars, for one bushel of corn. But remember where the law of one price comes from. It comes from the elimination of opportunities for arbitrage, for buying low and selling high. So let's see whether there is an opportunity for arbitrage when these are the prices for one bushel of corn in the two countries, given these exchange rates. Imagine you sit in Europe. You have the option of spending 10 euros to buy one bushel of corn. Or you can go to the United States and buy that same bushel of corn for $10. But first you have to buy those dollars because you're sitting in Europe with euros. So it takes 0.8 euros to buy $1. That means it'll take 8 euros to buy $10. Which means for the person sitting in Europe, a bushel of corn in the United States will only cost 8 euros whereas it costs 10 euros if you buy it in Europe. The prices haven't equalized. There's an opportunity to buy low and sell high. Now, that means that the purchasing power for the person sitting in Europe isn't the same across the two countries. You can buy more bushels of corn in the United States than you can in Europe with the same amount of euros. In other words, the purchasing power is not at parity. And so we would say we don't have purchasing power parity, which is just another way of saying the law of one price doesn't hold. So now let's change the prices. Let's suppose that the price for a bushel of corn in Europe is only 8 euros. If it's 8 euros, then if you're sitting in Europe, you have the choice of buying one bushel for 8 euros or you can go to the United States and buy that same bushel for $10, but first you have to buy the dollars. It costs 0.8 euros to buy $1, so it'll cost 8 euros to buy $10. So that same bushel of corn in the United States would also cost you 8 euros. Now we have purchasing power parity and the law of one price holds. We can think about the same thing for someone sitting in the United States. They can buy a bushel of corn for $10. Or they can go to Europe and buy it for 8 euros, but first they have to buy those 8 euros. It costs $1.25 to buy a euro. So to buy 8 euros would be $1.25 times 8, which is $10. So to buy the 8 euros that will get you the one bushel in Europe costs you $10, just as it costs $10 to buy that same bushel in the United States. We have purchasing power parity. The purchasing power of what you have is the same across the two regions. So now we can see that the exchange rate of the dollar that achieves purchasing power parity in this corn market is equal to the price of corn in Europe divided by the price of corn in the US. The price of corn in Europe is 8. The price of corn in the United States is 10. 8 divided by 10 gives us 
That's the exchange rate that achieves purchasing power parity when the price of a bushel of corn is 8 euros in Europe and 10 dollars in the United States. Now, of course, in the real world, we don't just worry about the price of corn. So the way we would express the impact of purchasing power parity on exchange rates in the real world is to think of a price index for the general price level in Europe and the price index for the general price level in the United States. And the exchange rate of the dollar that's determined through purchasing power parity would be the ratio of the general price level in Europe divided by the general price level in the United States. 